appreciate that. Special this morning. Acts chapter number five this morning. Acts chapter number five. Appreciate your singing this morning. It's encouraging when we come to the house of God and we worship the Lord. And I pray the Lord was pleased with our singing and worshiping of him today as well. In your bulletin, as Chris had mentioned, there are summer events. That, uh, these events are what's happening during our Wednesday evening uh, midweek service times. The last couple of years, we divided up. We had classes you could choose from, and we just wanted to just keep things fresh, and um, we don't want to get stale in any area. So we have so many, so many folks that are uh, visiting our church, new to our church. How many, how many of you in the room right now, there's somebody you don't know? Great. So we want to invite you out Wednesday evening and, uh, so that you could say you know everybody in the church. And so we're going to, give, we're going to have food ready. Uh, you could be uh, getting here probably 6.30 or so, um, and then we'll start about 7 o'clock, our normal midweek service time. And this is just something we're doing just, just this Wednesday, and I think we're going to do another one in July the same way. And uh, there's no nurseries, no, no children's programs, no teens. Everybody's together. And uh, you say, well, I don't want to uh, play games. You don't have to play games. Bring a chair, a lawn chair, a blanket. We'll sit out here on the field and just fellowship together, talk together, and uh, introduce yourself. If you don't know somebody, just come and introduce yourself to someone. Most people in our church are friendly, and only a few bite. The rest of us are just normal, non-biting people and, and um, won't hurt you at all. But the best way to get to know someone, the Bible says a, friend, a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And if you'll put yourself out there and uh, be friendly, I guarantee you'll make a friend. And we need, we need Christian friendship. We need encouragement. And it's biblical. And so we, uh, this, this coming Wednesday, we want you to come. We'll have dinner ready for you. And uh, then, then we're going to have some organized games. And so the kids will be playing, the teens will be playing. And um, it'll just be a great time of fellowship. And that is for all ages. And um, uh, if you do this, if you can come, if you're planning on coming, would you take your Connect card right now or the one that's in the bulletin or the seat pocket in front of you? And on the back side of that, it says event sign up. Would you just put your name and how many people are coming so that we know we have enough hot dogs and hamburgers for you uh, so that when you come, we don't want to run out of food. So if you right now, before we get in the message, if you just take that card Fill out who's coming, how many people are coming, and then at the end of the service, we'll tell you what to do with that. But uh, do that, because I don't want to forget that. And um, then you'll see the rest of the um, service schedule there. That's, everything is on Wednesday uh, evenings, and we'll talk about that each week. Um, but I hope that you'll be here this coming Wednesday. Also, in the bulletin, you're going to see there is an international dinner. That's going to be a lot of fun as well. That's going to be a, su a, a Sunday evening on July 14th. And uh, Derek Hummel, one of our missionaries, is going to be speaking. They're going to be heading back to their mission field and um, uh, Peru, and we'll, we'll uh, send them off. But uh, we're just going to have an international dinner. We're going to do it in the uh, gymnasium, and we're going to ask that you bring uh, your favorite dish, American, Chinese, Mexican, Italian, or all of the above. Uh, you can bring your favorite dish. We'll, we're going to have dinner together and uh, all a challenge on missions, world missions, world evangelism. And so uh, it's going to be a really special Sunday evening. And again, I hope that you'll put that on your calendar, that you'll be here. And uh, I guarantee that you will enjoy that, be challenged by it. And so we look forward to all summer long uh, having times of fellowship, getting together as a church family, and just praising the Lord for who he is. All right, Acts chapter number five. And if you'll allow me, I'm going to pick up reading in... in um, uh, verse number 34 of chapter 4, uh, Acts chapter 4, and then we'll get right into ver chapter number 5. So let's begin reading in verse number 34 of Acts chapter 4. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were uh, possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Joseph, by, who by the apostles' name was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite of the, com of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. And so we see, beginning in chapter number four, that what was happening, in, and understand what's going on in the context of, of the world at this time. 
we, we had uh, uh, Jews from all over the world were coming back to Jerusalem on this day of Pentecost. And on this, this day of Pentecost, we read in the beginning of the book of Acts, the gospel was preached and some 3,000 people were saved. And the Bible said this, and many were added to the church daily. So the church was growing every single day. Not everyone that was, was uh, from Jerusalem was there. They came from all over for this event of Pentecost. And once they got saved, they stayed in Jerusalem. Now, they stayed. They didn't have jobs. They didn't have places to live. They, they couldn't afford to, to survive there. And many of them, because they also were saved, they weren't able to go back to their families or to their businesses. Many a times in those days, the, the family had a family business. And so if you, uh, if you began to be a, a follower of Christ and no longer followed the, the Jewish religion, may, maybe your family didn't want you to come back, and you weren't allowed to get back into the family business. You could have lost your job or your home or, or your livelihood. All of these things were changing all around them as they were trusting Jesus. And while this is happening, this exciting growth was taking place in the New Testament church. But there's a problem. Where do you put people? How do you feed them? How do you clothe them? They've got thousands of people now that have been added to the church, and there was a great need. And so what we find in Acts chapter number 4, as we just read, there were some that owned land and some that owned houses. And in what they did, willingly, they began to sell what they had for the main purpose of giving it back to the church, or there they laid it at the apostles' feet, so that when people came and had a need, they could feed them and clothe them and put them in a place to stay. Could you imagine the church growing at such a rate? We got up every, every Sunday and said this, we need someone to house five more people. Is anybody, anybody able to feed or house people? This, this caused the church to be tightly fit, united. The Bible uses this word, they had all things in common, meaning this, that whatever there was a need, somebody said, I'll, I'll give so that that need is met. I, I, I'll, I'll invest in the life of someone else because they, the church was growing at such a, a rapid race, uh, a place here. But then we find in verse number five, or chapter number five, verse number one, there's that word, but. It's almost like this exciting thing is taking place. The, the, the uh, 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 Barnabas and others were, were, were giving. The, in verse number 33, the Bible says, great grace was upon them all. What an exciting time in the church. They were seeing God move. They were seeing God supply. They were just vessels that God could use to bring him glory. And, and Christ was being exalted. And the resurrection through Christ was being preached. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. And that word, but, if you didn't read the rest of the story, that just kind of tells you there's going to be a problem. And so here are two people, Ananias and Sapphira, the husband and wife, they said, we're going to be a part of this as well. And they sold their possession, their, their lot of land. But look with me in verse number two. This is where the problem lies. And they kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. And so Ananias said, we're going to sell this land. He and his wife both agreed to it. But what they agreed to privately was this. We're going to say that we sold it for this much, but really we're going to sell it for more. We'll keep the difference, and nobody will know. The church is going to get exactly what we said that we, they would get, but we're going to keep back a little bit. But Peter said to Ananias in verse number 3, Why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? While it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto man, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. And fear, great fear came on all them that heard these things. Could you imagine a church service? We're getting ready to take the offering. One of our members come up and say, I want to give an offering, and this is what I agreed to give. And all of a sudden, that wasn't him. He didn't give the offering, I promise. <laughs> all of a sudden, 
this rebuke comes. And, 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 and Peter says to Ananias, why have, you, why have you lied to the Holy Ghost? And immediately they, he falls dead. How many of you would sit up in your seat and say, something's going on here? You know what happens? The Bible says fear came upon them. Fear came upon them. And, and the Bible says that in verse 6, and the young men arose, wound him up, carried him out, and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours. That right there tells me I should preach longer. You know, there's a church service went on for three hours. But I want you to think about this. What happened in those three hours? You just saw Ananias. I'll tell you what happened. Such fear caused, they couldn't even, no one moved, no one spoke. So how do you know that? Because when his wife came in three hours later, she didn't know what happened. Such fear came upon them. You know what I believe was happening? People were checking their hearts. They were getting right with God. They, 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 they weren't concerned. Well, we got to go tell Ananias, uh, uh, his wife, what, what, what was going on with him so that, that uh, he, she knows what's going on. No, they, for three hours, she had no idea what happened. The Bible says that she came in. Three hours after, when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in, and Peter answered unto her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yeah, for so much. And he said, so tell me, did you sell it for this? And she said, yeah, that's what we sold it for. And Peter said unto her, how is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Could you imagine this type of church service? Then she fell down straightway at his feet and yielded up the ghost. She died. And the young men came in, found her dead, carried her forth, buried her by her husband. And look with me in verse number 11. And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. Chapter number five really gets exciting for the church. In the book of Acts, we find in this chapter, and it'll take us several weeks to get through this chapter, and I want to look at the commitments of a healthy church. Over the next several weeks, few weeks, we're going to look at the commitments of a healthy church. You see, up until this point, now Peter and John have been jailed. Up until this point, the great excitement was taking place in the church. But now the church members here in this chapter, they're going to be put to the test. They're going to be put to the test in this area of giving. They're going to be put to the test in the area of honesty. They're going to be put to the test in the area of persecution. This chapter here, what it's going to do, it's really going to, it's going to allow the church to go through a process, a pruning process. Those who are truly followers of Christ that want to see him work and those that aren't serious about it. Now they say, they, as we look at uh, uh, end time prophecy, many Bible scholars believe, and I'm one, uh, not a Bible scholar, but I'm one to believe what these Bible scholars say, is that there's going to be a great persecution that comes to our church, the church of Christ. And it's really going to, it's going to kind of uh, uh, disrupt things and, 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 and they believe this, that there's going to be uh, uh, really a show of those that are truly followers of Christ and those that are just conveniently following. It's, it's going to be the difference between those that believe and preach the prosperity gospel, that if you get saved, everything, all your problems are going to go away and you're going to become rich, for those that really believe that the, the gospel of suffering. You see, we've yet to really see in America the gospel of suffering for great persecution for those that believe. Oh, we look and say society today is persecuting Christians. I, I want to say to this uh, church, we've not seen persecution as Christians yet. No one stopped us on the way in this morning and asked us where we were going and we had to secretly come to church. 
We don't have to cover our church sign or hide our Bibles in society today. Maybe, maybe there are some things that are happening that we see signs of persecution coming, but I want us to understand today, we haven't experienced here in America persecution of the church yet. There are some around this world that are. Their life is being threatened, they're being jailed, and some even are being killed today for their faith in Jesus Christ. But in chapter number five, God is growing the church, but he's also beginning to show the commitments that he's desiring from his church. There's a lot of excitement here in the church. Miracles are being done. People are getting saved. The church is growing on a daily basis. The leaders are standing against religious rulers with great boldness, and they're preaching the resurrection of Christ. I mean, this is an exciting time. Could you imagine people saying, Peter and John, you should have seen them. They healed that, that lame man, and, and they boldly preached, and, and the rulers that crucified Christ, they, they, they didn't take Peter and John. They, they were a little bit of afraid of Peter and John because so many people are following what we believe now. This is such an exciting thing that it's taking place. And all of a sudden now, if the church is exciting, but now it's like the commitment's going to come. How committed to the church are you? We're going to find out in chapter 5 that the next level of a healthy church requires a commitment from all those that are involved. I want you to see in verse number 34 down to 37, which we read, there was a commitment to give. Now hear me today, this message is not about giving. And I'm not trying to, 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 to pat it and apologize before I, before I begin to preach. This is about honesty before the Holy Ghost. This is not about giving necessarily, although what was being used here was giving. I do not believe that it's the model of our church today that every one of us ought to go and, 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 and sell everything that we have and then bring the money back to the church. That's not the reason why this was happening at this time is because, as I explained, there was a great need. People were being saved that weren't living in Jerusalem, that needed to stay in Jerusalem, that, that, that needed to live and needed to survive in Jerusalem. And so circumstances were different here, but, but, but the principles behind it are still the same. There's a commitment to give. Can you see here as we read this portion of Scripture the sacrificial commitment that these members had? The, 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 Lord, the Lord used this sacrificial commitment. People had lands and people had homes and they said, we're willing to sell these things because somebody in our church and our family has a great need. There was a lack, of, a lack of selfishness here. There was a spirit of sacrificial giving. And they did this, and you see in verse number 34, neither was there any among them that lacked. You know why? In the church, nobody had a need because those that had were willing to sacrifice and give. Look again in verse number 35. The Bible says, And laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. Now hear me today. I believe this. In many cases in churches today, we have lost focus of the purpose of why we give. We, we give at times to, to big, build bigger buildings or, 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 or uh, uh, buy maybe things that maybe aren't necessary. The purpose of giving here in the New Testament church is because people had needs and others wanted to help meet those needs. And I would say, church, let's never lose sight of that's the reason why we give. They give because the gospel needed to go forth. They give because people had great needs. The church ought to be the place that when the, those followers of Christ have needs, they ought to be able to go to the church to get those needs met because there's people there willing to help meet those needs. Now, I must say, and I, and I don't just say this because I pastor this church and, I, and I'm a member of this church. I say this with true sincerity. There are many churches uh, that uh, are churches, but I'm telling you, there's not many like this church. Every single time I feel like a need is presented to this church, this church continually steps up and meets that need. 
What a wonderful thing that is. Now, I want you to know, church, that is New Testament Christianity. It's giving and sacrificing because people have great needs. And God uses your gift, and God uses the gift here in Acts chapter 4, and in, in, in was supposed to use the gift of Ananias and Sapphira in chapter number 5. God uses these gifts to minister to others. Hear me today. When you give with a sacrificial heart, you're giving so that God meets a need of another person. And what a wonderful thing that is. What a wonderful example we see here in this passage of Scripture. So giving meets the, meets the needs of the brethren. This was God's plan for the church. Your giving encourages the brethren. Look with me in verse number 36. In Joseph, who was by the apostle, surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite in the country, of, uh, the country of Cyprus, having laid, sold it, brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. You know what Barnabas is known as? Is He's known as being the encourager. And ever from the first time that we're introduced to Barnabas, you know what we find him doing? Desiring to encourage the brethren desiring to give sacrificially so that needs could be met of others. I want you to see here that this commitment of a healthy church, it, 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 it uh, brings unity. Look with me in verse number 32, just a few verses up. Uh, chapter number 4, verse number 32. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither said of any of them that aught of these things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. This commitment that this healthy church had, it brought unity to the church. People weren't seen as like, they have this much and others have this. No, what it was, the Bible says here, everybody, all things were in common. Everyone just saw each other equally. This commitment was a unifying thing. There was one heart. There was one soul. You know what that means? There was no jealousy. Now hear me, please, today. This is a chapter, a lot of these leading up to this, this there were a lot of exciting things. You know, you, you preach about someone getting healed and you preach about the, the persecution and, and getting out of jail and all that. Boy, you can get really excited. This is one of those more pastoral messages. You say, why are we preaching this? Because we're preaching through the book of Acts and this is the chapter we come to. Hear me. When someone gives, there should be no jealousy of others that aren't able to give as much. When others give in the church, it ought to bring great excitement that a need is met. Not jealousy because you weren't the one to meet the need. This, there was no, no, no hard feelings because some gave more than others. I don't know why, why there was one man that was named because the Bible leads us to believe this in this chapter that there are multitudes of people that gave. But Barnabas is one man that was mentioned. I'm not sure if they mention him because we're going to find his name later in the book of Acts, but it's just kind of unique to me and, and a little, little odd was as I studied through this passage of Scripture that we say, the Bible says that many gave but just mentions one man. And then we get into chapter number five, and, and, and two people are mentioned, but they're not mentioned in a positive way. They're, they're mentioned more as examples of what not to do. But you know what I find? Just because Barnabas' name was mentioned and, and Barnabas gave, this was a public thing. They were coming in and, and giving publicly before the church. Others that weren't able to give maybe as much as Barnabas gave didn't, didn't have hard feelings. They weren't upset because Barnabas is giving. They weren't questioning Barnabas' motive of giving. He said, how do you know that? I know that because the Bible says they were of one heart and one soul. There was great unity in the church. 
You see, they understood that God has blessed some, and some are able to give, maybe more than others. Some had more land, or their houses were worth more. But none of that mattered. What mattered was this, that God was bringing the church together, that people were committed to the church, and that people's needs were being met because someone was willing to follow the Lord in the Holy Spirit. There were no divisions or disputes about what was given. You see, in a healthy church, those that had gave so those that were without could have their needs met. And that united the brethren. He, he, hear me, church, this morning. When we hear, when we hear that someone gave so a need in the church was met, it ought to excite everybody in the church whether you yourself were able to give or not. When, when you hear that uh, an offering was taken or a need was met, and, and listen, not everybody can give at the same level. Not everybody owned land. Not everyone owned houses. Some might have owned larger land. Some might have owned larger houses. Listen to me. The amount isn't what was necessary. The amount isn't what was celebrated. It was the obedience and the commitment level and the fact that all those that were there were getting their needs met because there were people in the church that were willing to step out by faith and sacrifice so that God could do a great work in the church. It's important for us to see their spirit was right in giving and the spirit of the church was right in receiving. What was interesting is this. This was open giving. This was people coming to church. Now you say, so are we going to start? No, no, just stay with me here. What this showed, though, is that this young church, it showed their commitment, it showed their sacrifice, it showed their love for the Lord. We, we, don't, we don't want to talk about what someone uh, gave because the, we don't want anyone else to feel like they're not important. They weren't concerned about that. I had someone one time say to me, Pastor, I wish you wouldn't tell how much someone gave because I'm not able to give that and it doesn't make me, I, I feel like inadequate if I'm not able to give. And I opened the scripture up to this. I said, well, I want to show you scripturally, when people give, the church rejoices. I, I, I want to use an example here today. And the Sun family is sitting right down here, and they've gone through great, great trial and great tragedy in their life. Great trial. In, 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 in reality, it's far from over. And so many people in the church have said to me, what can we do to help? And the first thing I say is what? Pray. And if you're able to give, give. They had a, a great need. They, Frankie had to get, a, 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 they had to retain a lawyer. The lawyer wanted, Frank, it's okay if I tell him? The lawyer wanted $7,500. And that was just to represent Frankie. If, if this goes to trial, we don't know how much. So Frankie meets with this lawyer and, and they say it's going to be $7,500 and they only have $2,000. I mean, they're going, they're going through a lot. And they give this lawyer $2,000 and they're $5,500 short. I mentioned to our church family, church, let's pray. And if God puts it on your heart to, to give, give. Wednesday night, uh, I said to, to, to Frankie and church, I said, hey, we, we um, and I didn't know these numbers until Wednesday. I said, Frankie, I, we had some, some people give and want to help you with this need. I said, Frankie, what, what is the need? And he gave me these numbers. And I said, so you're $5,500 short? He said, yes. 
I went to Debbie on Friday. Debbie gave me a report of, of, of just the numbers. Someone take a guess of what was given last week for the Sun family. $5,500 to the penny. Not, not 5,600, not 5,400, not 5,505. Now, this wasn't just one person. This was multiple people giving. How in the world do we come up with the exact number that's needed for this family that comes from this church? I'll tell you how. God. God. God meets the needs when a people are willing to sacrificially give. We see it played out. Listen, I read Acts chapter 5, and I say, boy, in, in Acts chapter 4, boy, that must have been neat to live in those days. Guess what, Mount Clover Road Baptist Church? We're living in those days. We're seeing this happen right before our eyes. We're seeing the New Testament church played out and lived out because a church like this is willing to do what the Bible tells us to do and be led by the Spirit of God. Listen, you, you can't just make that stuff up. I sat at my desk on Friday afternoon and I just wept. Listen to me, it wasn't the size of the gift. It was the fact that God met that need to the penny. To the penny. We didn't announce that, and we didn't stop it once it got to a certain amount. It's what, got, what, what a member, a family needed in our church when, when, when they were in great need, and, and God promised to meet our needs, and, and we find this is playing out in the lives of people that we love. And he's using you to do it. And thank God. Praise God. Those that are able to financially give and help when they do it should encourage the brethren. Listen, I'm not upset last week that I didn't get $5,500 given to me. I, I, it, didn't, it didn't discourage me. You know what? I sat there and said, God's going to supply. You know what that does? It encourages me to know that if I'm ever in a place a great need. You know what that encourages me to know? That God's big enough to meet that need. God is showing you and he's showing this church that he will take care of your needs. Just trust him. And by you having the heart of a Barnabas, by you having a heart of someone that's willing to sacrifice, what you do is you not only help the person that is in need, you help encourage the church to continue to stay faithful, to continue to trust God, to continue to believe that God's word is true and he's going to meet the need in your life one day. I thank God for that. I want you to see this. Not only is there a a commitment to give, there's a commitment to honesty here. In verse number one, look with me in chapter five, but a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thy heart to lie? The Holy Ghost and keep back part of that price of the land. Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto man, but unto God. Are we supposed to sell everything you have and give it all to the church? No. That's not what this is saying. Again, I don't believe that this is a passage about money. I don't believe that this is a passage on giving. It's a passage on a making a commitment to God and keeping a commitment. That's what this is. And hear me, we live in a day, a day today that if we don't like something, we can just walk away from it. No commitment. 
No commitment in relationships, no commitments in, in work, no commitments in church. We, we can even make vows to God and walk away and in time not live up to that commitment. And, and that's what this chapter is about. This is about this. God is desiring for his people to commit something. You know what he's, he, he expects? For you to keep that commitment. Listen, he expects you when you commit something. I, I did a wedding last evening here at our church and, 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 and they made their vows and said, I do and I will and all the other stuff that, that comes with it. And you know what God expects from them? To keep their commitment. When you commit, he expects you to com uh, keep that commitment. That's what we find here, a commitment to honesty. What is committed, God doesn't take lightly. I've said to my son this, if you are getting paid to work, you're making commitment. When you go to work, then work. Make a commitment. How many of you love going in and, and the person's on their phone and they're supposed to be waiting on you and they say, hold on, you know, let me finish texting, you know, my girlfriend or boyfriend here and then I'll get to you. Or you go into a store and they're complaining that they have to work. No, listen, man, if, if, you, if you have a job and you're getting paid, guess what? Your commitment to work. I'll go a step further. Even if you're not getting paid, but you're committed to do it, you're committed to work. In your marriage, you're committed. When you take a vow, when you say, I'm going to do something, hear me, church, God expects you to follow through with that in every area of your life. This just has specifically in chapter number five, it had to do with the commitment they made. They said, we're gonna sell this piece of land and we're going to give this amount to the church. Maybe the land sold for more, I don't know. Maybe they knew it would sell for more and so they said, we're gonna give this amount knowing and hoping they'd get more. We don't know the details. All we know is what they gave, what they said they were going to do and what they gave didn't match up. You know what we find? God was not pleased. I want you to turn with me to uh, 1 Corinthians, if you would please, just quickly, 1 Corinthians. Are you with me? All right, 1 Corinthians chapter number 16. I tell you, where does time go? I feel like I just get started up here and... Time to be done. Verse number one of chapter 16. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given an order to the church of Galatia, even so do ye. This is what Paul's saying to the New Testament churches. Hey, Galatia's doing this, and, and the church at Corinth is doing this, and, 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 and I believe it's in God's word because we ought to be doing this as well. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him that there be no gathering when I come. What was Paul saying, suggesting to the church? Listen, anything that God prospered you this week, bring it to the house of God. Lay it in store. Give an offering of the Lord. What is that offering for? That offering is so that we continue. We praise God. We thank God. Our offering is an offering of thanksgiving. Our offering is an offering of praise. When we, when we collect our offering or, or, or pass the, the, the plates and, and as you give, and, and some give online, and some give through mailing it in, however you do that, what you're doing, that offering is a gift to God. We call it in New Testament, we call it grace giving. As God has supplied, we're to give. I argue back and forth at times, and someone will say to me, well, we don't find tithing in the New Testament. My answer to that is, you know what, I may agree with you on that. And I'm glad you brought that up. Because if under the law 10% was required, why would we give less under grace? The reality is this, we probably want to give more under grace. If it was required in the law, now that we're saved and we realize what Christ has done under grace, we want to give with a joyful heart. I don't give now because I have to. We want to give now because it's such a joy. So I get to give back. I get to give. Listen, there's myths about giving and myths about tithing. And, and some will say this, you, got, you tithe and you give so that you get back. If that's why you're giving and tithing, you're giving for the wrong reason. 
Well, I, and this is why, church, I, I say this so often. I say this so often to you. Be careful what you listen to. Be careful what you hear. Be, ta- be careful what you fall into. Be careful. There, there are some... There are some that want you to give. They're, they're, and I named names a couple weeks ago. There are some that, get, that want you to give. And, and, and they're not wanting you to give so that you get back. They're wanting you to give so they can pay for their multi-million dollar jet. I mean, that's not New Testament Christianity. If they're trying to convince you that you give so you get something back, you're giving for the wrong reason. If they're trying to convince you that you give so that you find favor, you're giving for the wrong reason. If you're giving so you get more, you're giving for the wrong reason. Listen, I'm so blessed. I I love God, what he did for me on the cross. That's why I want to give to him. We want to give because we have an honest heart. I tithe because I love the Lord. Simply that. I want to give to him. I, I want to show my love to him. Every, every so often, I, last evening, I performed a wedding. And, and, and I'm, it's hard for, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a bad one to, to, especially on a wedding or a funeral, you do something for a church member and they want to give you something. And I feel, I feel personally, I just feel like I'm your pastor. I'm supposed to do this. But last evening, I did a wedding and they gave me a thank you card and, and, and I just put it in my back pocket and I got home that evening and I opened it up and in it was a little bit of money. So you know what I did with that? I went down to Dick's Sporting Good and I bought myself a new, no I didn't, I didn't. I didn't. I wanted to but I didn't. No, what I did with that is I took 10% of that and gave it to the Lord. And I took half of that, 50% of that. You know what I did? I gave it to my wife. And the girls will get the other 50% throughout the week. (laughs) See, why'd you do that? Because I love the Lord and I love my wife. And those that you love, you give. I, I I didn't say, oh, I can't believe Michelle's gonna get 50% 50% of this. I couldn't wait. I gave it to her and I got a smooch for it. I said, I might give her the other 50%. You see, when you love, it doesn't hurt to give. It doesn't hurt to give because you give because you love. And that was the question here that Peter had for Ananias and Sapphira again it wasn't the giving it was why aren't you honest enough before the Lord if you love him you'll be truthful if you love him you'll be honest my time is through and I pray this message this morning made sense to our church This is probably not one that we'll put up on WLMB because it might not make sense. This is one of the ones that I feel like this is for our church. We give because we love the Lord. We give because it encourages brothers and sisters. We give because it encourages us to know that God is going to see us through. His word is true. When you have a need, God will meet that need. You know most of the time who he does it through? His church. And so today, my question to us would be this. Are we willing to sacrifice? Are we willing to live this pattern? I'm not asking anybody to sell property and bring it to the church. But if God asked you to, would you? And if God has told you and you have committed something to God, whether it be in your marriage, whether it be in, in giving, whether it be maybe a call, maybe there's someone here that said, God, I'm, I'm going to commit to ministry. I'm going to commit to this. I'm going to commit to, to winning souls. I'm going to commit to giving out tracts. I'm going to commit to whatever. God expects you to keep that commitment. That person you're sitting next to, 
love them. God expects you to keep that commitment. You see, a church doesn't just run when things get hard. It gives and allows God to work through that. Let's pray together. Father.